uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, I'm Viraj Karambelkar. As Michael mentioned, I'm a grad student at Caltech. And it's very nice. It seems like we are the closing act in terms of talks for the school. And uh, Harsha and I are going to talk about um, introduction to other surveys. And basically, I'm sure all of you through this week have found out how amazing ZTF is at what it does. And so, but in reality, if you look outside, as again, Michael mentioned, there are a myriad of other time domain surveys. And so the question is, why are astronomers, including myself, trying to build other surveys when uh, ZTF is so awesome at what it does? And so, yeah, I would like to start by maybe uh, spend a, like a minute or two on an uh, activity. And I want uh, people in the chat or people online or however you're connected, maybe you can speak up. But uh, why do you think we need surveys other than ZTF? So this is a very nice ZTF telescope dome. Uh, it looks very pretty. It's got a very nice sky background. It's really amazing. So why, why do why do people think that we need uh, other surveys? Um, are there any ideas? You can I guess feel free to unmute or write in chat if you have any question if you have any thoughts on this. Covering the other half of the sky. Yep, excellent point because to see the southern sky again, uh, cross matching and verification. Yep, another excellent point. There are other bands in the electromagnetic spectrum, survey in the infrared to explore kilonovi, redder transients, use different filters. Yeah, so let me uh, put what I had, and I think the things that I have on this slide covers pretty much everything that was mentioned in this chat. So the first one is ZTF is in California, which is in the Northern Hemisphere. So this is what the coverage of ZTF looks like. Nominally, you don't get any coverage below minus 30 declination. So if you're uh, if your favorite kind of transient is in the southern hemisphere, ZTF is not going to be able to see it. You need telescopes in the south. Uh, the second thing that was mentioned is that ZTF, again, it's in the western hemisphere, so it's in California. And as you know, like about two thirds of the time, you can't observe just because there's the sun outside. And sometimes, even during the night, you can't observe because there is it's raining or it's snowing and you can't open the dome. So. Uh, but the universe really doesn't care about what's happening to your telescope, right? It's the kilonova is not going to wait for it to be the ideal time to observe. So you need to make sure that um, you have te different telescopes that are actually at geographically different locations so that you can uh, increase your chances of detecting your favorite kind of transient. Uh, the other thing, I guess, is that ZTF reaches, uh, is a predefined survey, so it reaches a depth of 20.5 magnitudes. And if you want to detect something, anything fainter, currently it's not possible with ZTF. And also ZTF has its own cadence. So you may have, like it does observations every, roughly every two or three days. But if for some reason you wanted, you for your for your kind of favorite transient, you wanted a different cadence or something, you need, then you would want your own survey telescope. And the final thing, which was also mentioned in the chat is that ZTF is restricted to the optical wavelengths. And Really, you uh, there's nothing in principle. Astronomy happens over a very broad range of wavelengths, all the way from X-rays to ultraviolet to infrared and radio. So there is really nothing stopping you. In in principle, there is nothing stopping you from searching from using these other wavelengths as well. In addition to ZTF. So with that sort of brief prelude, uh, I think the by the hopefully by the end of this talk, you will be able to learn about the importance of having the some of the other optical time domain surveys that are running in the uh, that are running right now on the Earth and uh, uh, basically understand the importance of having a global network of telescope of follow-up using an example of the Growth India Telescope. And Harsh will be covering both of these topics. And I will be talking about something that is uh, that I, I am interested in and I mainly do, which is, the, which is infrared time domain astronomy. And we learn about why infrared time domain astronomy is important and why it is so difficult to do from ground-based telescopes. And so at this point, I think I'll hand it over to Harsh for uh, talking about optical sir. Optical time domain surveys. Take it away, Harsh. Uh, yeah, thank you, Viraj. Uh, you can stop controlling the screen, I guess. Um, that will be better. Yeah, thanks. So, um, yeah, I would like to take a step back uh, from where we are started, like why we need more new surveys or why other surveys that are there has come to the GTF, but why the surveys are actually important in the first place. Um, we know like at, at the starting, we would like to have like map the sky, we would like to get the mapping the source, galaxy and whatever. And now we, we have like many, many surveys that actually have done that for us uh, since a long time now. So uh, at this point, like why do we why do we think that the surveys are contrastingly important? Um, 
the main point is basically like the, the universe that is there it's not static there are um, various sort of extreme physics phenomena happening um, all over the time all over the different space uh, so we actually need to keep monitoring it continuously so that whatever that was just are happening we can just study them and and study our universe in a better way uh, this includes the phenomenon called transients which are happening like um, in on, on a shorter time scale as compared to the human beings uh, this includes the kilonovae, supernovae, and all other tangents that you would have heard of in the last five days. Uh, then there are these near Earth objects which are you know, continuously like marching towards Earth or, or towards the center of our solar system, and in in the sense like they are passed by the Earth, which which could be, could be hazardous, which we need to keep monitoring about and uh, actually learn a lot of about uh, about those things. Uh, so the, the way most of these survey operate are actually by like tiling up the whole sky, keep monitoring this whole sky. Uh, for example, if you you just take this sky map. Uh, then in ideal case, like what different surveys do, they, they may make a tiling of all of these, keep looking for the different images across the different uh, portion of the sky, and then finally look for new and new transients. Um, this is one of, the, one of the ways in which these survey telescopes do. Um, they might have like some specific quantity case also, like for example, on your screen, you are able to see uh, one of the localization from a GW trigger, which came from LIGO in 2015. Uh, so in such case, like the telescope don't usually go for their regular time schedule they actually make a new schedule and try to um, cover the, the portion that is required so so the, these contours that you're able to see on your screen are actually the, the probability region uh, of that particular source that that you are trying to find out uh, for an example you can take a gtf um, uh, fov um, in form of a single tile and in, in order to do this you actually go ahead and try to tile this whole region out and and then try to look for the different um, new transients that are popping up in, into the sky. The way you do it, actually, you, you take these new images that you are getting uh, in the real time. And uh, given these surveys have actually covered this this whole uh, sky multiple times in the past, you can um, take pull up those uh, reference images which you have um, already obtained a few, um, few years back or a few months back, which which don't have this transient that is popping up right now. Uh, so you you take both of these and actually separate that and try to to get the whatever the new candidate that is there. Um, this is what most of the the surveys do, and they keep uh, regularly like uh, looking for these new and new candidates and try to report those as soon as possible. That's basically the primary task uh, of each and every survey telescope is. Uh, the other things come later on. Uh, so this is what the other telescope also do. Uh, other survey telescope also do uh, apart from the GTF. For example, the uh, you might have heard of this name uh, Atlas, which is um, th these uh, two point half uh, half meter telescope located in Hawaii, uh, and they, they have again like a very wide field of view to to cover up the whole sky. Uh, on the topmost left part of your screen, you are able to see that um, the, it it also again covers like the sky, which is mostly in the northern part, uh, excepting this this um, this uh, our galactic uh, um, plane uh, over here. Uh, but again, there, there is some part that is there in the southern patch, which is uh, again not visible to this uh, particular telescope because it's in Hawaii. So what they what they are doing now is that they are setting up a telescope in the southern part of, of the uh, southern hemisphere, uh, a, a telescope in Chile and South Africa, so that they will be able to cover up the whole sky um, in in uh, say with the help of these four uh, telescopes that they are doing. Uh, the typical depth of this particular survey is uh, about 19 and a half to 20 mag it vary between like different weather conditions you know in 30 seconds and it covers the the full full night sky four times per night uh, so again it's very very rapid and i actually have discovered a lot of um, new candidates uh, new new supernovas new different type of objects that uh, you you can actually go ahead and follow uh, mainly although this was uh, set up to monitor the the uh, near Earth objects that are uh, marching towards the Earth, but again, uh, if, when you have these um, reference image available, people try to look into it in more detail and try to dig up the different type of objects that you um, already have in these images. Uh, a similar type of task is also done by um, PenStars, uh, which is about two um, telescopes of about 1.8 meter each, and um, this is actually like one of the most complete uh, survey. Uh, along with the GTF in, in the northern hem hemisphere, which, which caused this um, this th uh, approximately three pi of the sky out of the four pi, uh, and up to a very very good uh, depth of about 22 magnitudes. So, so this is what makes it very very unique. Uh, the typical um, band they use is actually a wide band, which is a combination of basically G, R, and I uh, optical composite filter. 
again this was again a, a, a telescope that was set up or the survey that was set up to uh, do the new study but again people are trying um, and to to locate the different uh, type of um, transients that are there in the in that so so um, uh, on the left hand side you are able to see this telescope this is the the camera which is quite big um and the story doesn't end over here there have been many many uh, different survey telescopes that have been set up along with um, over the time um, as DSS you might have heard of, which which was set up somewhere around 2000 and run in different phases. Um, it actually is, has created the most detailed 3D map of, of our uh, galaxy and the nearby universe. Uh, Assassin is one of the prolific supernova hunters. Uh, and again, there are different, all of these different uh, survey have their different goals. So um, the point that I'm trying to make over here is that like, it's not just that each and every survey telescope are there, but they have their own limitations. Some are there in the uh, northern hemisphere, they, they can't go to the southern one. Some have their, their uh, limitation on their depth. Some are have a different science goal so that if people are trying to do some different science, they probably need to go to some other survey. So that's why you need uh, multiple of these surveys so that you can uh, cover all of these things. Um, all of these surveys are, are, are um, mainly concerted towards one thing that trying, they are trying to discover more and more things. Um, so, for example, um, take this candidate, which was like uh, discovered at this particular instant of time. So, uh, this is what what the main job that we are looking into different survey telescopes for. Um, but um, if, if you uh, want to look like if just the discovery is not enough, uh, because like um, I don't think like the the there. Um, if we, we suppose in in a case you assume that there are just the survey telescope, then each of these survey telescope are usually fixed styling and and. Uh, maybe fixed pointing directions where if you want to suppose you discover this target and you're trying to get a more and more data onto this particular candidate because uh, you never know like how this candidate will evolve it may basically rise it may get just flatten out uh, it may decay uh, uh, from uh, this point of insert or it may even decay at very very faster rate so uh, at the point of discovery you don't really know how this is going to evolve and that makes an important point like how this how would the evolution of this particular candidate will be? Um, for example, you take the kilonova, uh, which is basically an optical counterpart of the wave, where uh, you know that it will rise very, very fast and then decay very rapidly. So um, most of these telescopes have a fixed cadence. Suppose a telescope which has a which is working survey mode, uh, it covers the sky in three um, in three nights. So uh, between those two nights, you don't have really have any any. any um, we need to go back to this candidate and try to get more data. And uh, we, in some cases, you don't really want to wait for three days to look into this candidate, whether it will pop up or not. It maybe it would have minted too much, and it will never pop up again. So um, there is another aspect that um, that comes into play is uh, after discovery is this rapid follow, uh, where sometimes these candidates. Um, it evolve very very rapidly the rise or decay and you might want to get more and more data so that you can sample the light curve and try to understand these in a better way uh, there is also another aspect which is long term follow up where again survey mode as well as the follow up telescope that uh, i'm going to emphasize are going to come into play uh, so uh, the the discovery as well as the long term follow up are are the something which uh, these survey telescopes are most suitable for but if you are going to go for the rapid follow up telescope uh, then um, most of these survey telescopes don't have enough good cadence uh, where they can pull up most of these candidates. Uh, if you are trying to go for the supernova or any slow rolling candidate, then you might be saved by these uh, good cadence of this survey telescope. But if you are suppose uh, looking for a GRP afterglow, then it will decay within a day because they have like very, very uh, sharp decay uh, feature in form of a power law. Uh, so in that, those cases, you actually need a different type of telescope, which you, you refer to as a uh, follow-up telescope. Um, and also, like uh, not just the the depth and all these things, you you are also limited by the fact that uh, in the optical astronomy with the ground based based observatory, you can only observe in the, in, the, in the night sky. So whenever you are in, into this part of the sky, you can observe. But in in whenever the sun sun is out, uh, you are again dead because you can't uh, really get any photons uh, from the uh, the transients that you're interested in. So. Um, uh, a few years back, astronomers came together to bring out this fantastic idea of creating a network of telescope, which uh, we know currently as a growth India, uh, sorry, growth network, uh, which have these many, 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 many observatories across the world so that uh, if you discover a candidate with one particular telescope, you can uh, relate to the next observatory and so on um, with time so that you can have very, very continuous coverage and very early time data, which is crucial for many of these telescopes. Um, uh, this. Like this picture actually shows a lot of a lot of the 
the observatory that I mentioned on the last page, although these are not all, all of those, but still uh, most of those. Um, mainly I work on this particular uh, telescope. I'm most familiar with this. So I'm over the next few slides, I'm going to use this as an example of why um, not just the survey telescope, not the other survey telescope as compared to the GTF, but the, the follow-up telescope are also important that they play, play a crucial role. Uh, to go into that, uh, before that, I would like to introduce this telescope. Uh, it's essentially the uh, 0.7 meter telescope located in the uh, cold desert of Hanli uh, in Lata, which is a very, very beautiful place. And it's uh, more importantly, India's first um, robotic telescope. It's supported by this um, uh, small camera, which has a moderate field of view of about 0.7 by 7 degrees and uh, has very, very good depth of about uh, 20 and a half magnitude in five minutes. Uh, if you want to go deeper with this particular telescope, then you, you expose for more, more enough of time and then you stack the images to get uh, the deeper image up to 23 magnitudes. Um, this is what we have done in the past. Uh, the unique feature about this telescope is that uh, among all the Indian telescopes that are there, uh, uh, in India, which are like the most active telescope, this actually has much wider field of view uh, among all of these telescopes. On, on the center, you can see the size of a full moon. So it's about a little bit uh, more than the size of a full moon. So full moon is about 0.5 degree in diameter, and this is about 0.7 um, um, degree um, each arm of a square uh, field of view. And this, um, the importance of this uh, field of view, I will come back to in, in a couple of slides when I will emphasize that why uh, this field of view is very, very important, even for a follow-up telescope, even if it is not a, a, a survey telescope where you would like to cover up more part of the sky in very, very small amount of time. Uh, but I will come to that in a, in a moment. Uh, the other thing that you make it unique is, is the location of this particular telescope. So this is the observatory uh, which is located in India. Um, if you see that the longitudinal, um, uh, the longitude uh, location of this particular telescope is, is sitting right in, in between uh, Japan and the, the, uh, the Israel uh, telescope. So it, it makes it like a, a kind of cent uh, center point of um, uh, of the Japan and the Israel, which is giving a, a good good enough guidance whenever you are trying to follow up these telescopes, uh, whenever you are trying to follow up these all of these uh, candidates. Uh, but if suppose, for example, if uh, the Japan or the, the Taiwan weather is uh, not very good, then the importance became even more because um, after getting the discovery, suppose in United States um, at the GTF, uh, you are trying to go into Hawaii uh, and towards uh, say CAC or something, uh, and after that you you don't really have uh, anything in between. So if, if the weather uh, got clouded out over here, then uh, the, the location of this particular telescope becomes even more important. Uh, more importantly, it's actually like quite opposite to the globe uh, where it is about uh, 12 hour time difference between the GTF and uh, uh, the GIT. So which uh, actually gives the completely opposite part of what the light curve you are looking into, um, giving it to a decent enough status along with the GTF. Um, the way we uh, usually operate this uh, particular telescope is in a robotic way, where we uh, start with that target planning and uh, try to control the, the different aspects of the telescope using the different, uh, like the, the, the dome, that uh, the filter wheel, the camera, and, and the data person, everything has been automated in, in a way that they can uh, work into uh, get us the very, very good efficiency. Um, along with that, we have also uh, integrated it with the Slack boards, which are um, which keep monitoring the system, so there is no human uh, monitoring required. So uh, the, all of these boards are of different purpose. A few of these trigger the telescope for uh, the alerts that are coming in. Um, a few of these monitor the data detection part of it. Um, uh, this particular board actually monitor the light observation. It uh, try to solve the problem in the real time, and if it doesn't happen that way, then it actually goes up there was that, okay, you need to just wake up and uh, try to look into the telescope that there is some error which I'm not able to solve. Uh, so these actually help us in, in getting like uh, the, the going into the most robotic way that as we can. Um, to show the importance of this particular telescope, like why, why I'm like um, putting up all these advance is, is uh, basically this reason. Uh, so this is uh, one of the GW alert that um, came into 2019 um, on the night of 26 in India when uh, we were watching the Avenger movie. Uh, but the new universe um, collect all the stars to put in a way that, that we can't see this movie. And we uh, come back to see, okay, there is a nice uh, little alert with a very, very good um, uh, 
probability of the finding a candidate in uh, somewhere around the north pole there was another um, banana ship uh, over here and also there was some probability at the very very southern part of the hemisphere uh, so what what we did is that the uh, gtf usually cover all of these part and make tiling all of these uh, all of these uh, localization probability and then we usually follow up those candidates with the growth index scope in a typical way but for this particular thing uh, because the the high probability region was very near to the north pole uh, gtf was not able to find uh, and GTF covered this uh, banana patch in the northern part, and uh, the D cam, which is uh, um, a dark energy camera on a uh, four meter CTIO in southern hemisphere, uh, they covered the southern part. So the the most important part of this particular alert was left. Uh, so that's where we uh, come into play, and we uh, tile this particular. Uh, region with the growth in the telescope to cover up the the full northern cap and we make like different uh, tiling schedule um, or spanning over different night to to make sure that if we detect a candidate we are we are getting the full evolution of that particular candidate and we covered about 17 percent of the localization despite being the the smallest field of view telescope um, in this network so uh, this would show that um, every single survey telescope has its own limitations and um, those come into play um, whenever you don't want them to come in, in, in some way. Uh, so you are never saved by having a, a particular survey. Okay, this is the, the survey which is like the, the best survey of all time. But again, independently, it, it is not good enough to do all of the science cases. Uh, and going into the same way, people have bring in more and more survey telescope, more and more follow-up telescope with time uh, to the save um, everybody in the in the time of need. Um, going in, uh, following the same tradition, people have gone into the, the next big thing now, which is um, this Vera C is uh, observatory, which is coming in a couple of years now. Uh, so this particular uh, is, uh, telescope is again a will work in uh, survey mode in most of the time. Uh, it is this gigantic telescope of eight meter uh, class, and uh, it has very very big camera, which is made up of a combination of 189 CCD, um, giving a field of view about three and a half degree, if I correctly remember that. Uh, and and it's, it will produce tons of data, which is about um, 20 terabyte data, data per night. So this is going to be a, like a, the next uh, big data kind of problem in, into your hand. But uh, the beautiful part about this particular telescope is that it's very, very deep. So if we cover like the full operation of the telescope for over the next 10 years, then it is going to be about somewhere around 27, 28 magnitude in the R band. Uh, which is quite deep and also it, it it has like modest field of view about three and a half degrees so it can actually um cover up uh, a huge part of the sky with a very 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 good depth which uh, most of the survey telescope uh, in in current uh, day um, are are lacking so so most of the telescope actually go up to 21 22 or even with second 23 magnitude but it will again go go much much more deeper and having covering more uh, volume into the sky and giving many, many, many more uh, new transients and, and new uh, extreme physics. Uh, in order to just uh, give you a glimpse of what, um, what, how the things will change with uh, the, this uh, Rubin Observatory, this is one of the images on your screen uh, from uh, SDSS, the Snow and Digital Sky Survey. And the, the same patch, if you will look from the, this particular telescope, it is going to look something like this, where you can see that there is much more depth, much more resolution, and, and you, you will have like those candidates which you have you have never seen before. Uh, so this is like one aspect of all, all of the survey. So uh, going back onto our same plot that we we talk about discovery, we talk about the evolution and and uh, the rapid follow up of all of these events to look into like the extreme physics. But we missed a very very important point that all of the things that I talked about, all of the telescope or the survey that I talked about was actually uh, working in the optical region where mainly it's like um, somewhere around uh, two two. Uh, 100 to 7, 7 or 900 um, nanometer wavelength range. But uh, there is much more um, physics lying around in the different EM bands. So, for example, if you take the example of a kilonova, then um, kilonova are actually much more brighter and, and last for much more longer uh, into the, the near infrared as well as the infrared region. So, this is not what, what uh, just, just the only survey telescope we should be looking for. So, that's why people are going into much different regimes, uh, for example, near infrared, infrared. Uh, and and all other different bands. Uh, so uh, at this point, I would like to hand it over to Viraj to talk about the the other EM uh, spectrum of of, uh, uh, of other part of the EM spectrum where uh, he's going to talk about this mainly IR service. Uh, so Viraj, you can take over. Yep. Thanks, Harsh. Uh, uh, yeah, you can uh, request the controlling of the screen if you. Yes, need. yes, yes. I can. I can do it now. I'm able to do it. Thank you. Um, okay, yeah, thanks. So 
Uh, yeah, as Ash mentioned, I'm going to talk about infrared time domain surveys. And <clears throat> I'm sure, um, as all of you are aware, astronomy happens over a very wide range of wavelengths, but most ground-based time domain surveys have been focusing on the optical wavelengths uh, with op on optical bands of light where with wavelengths of about 0.3 microns to 1 micron. And then uh, recently, only recently, we have been starting to explore the dynamic infrared sky, uh, specifically at wavelengths between, so the infrared spans wavelengths between one micron to about a thousand microns. But uh, for a variety of reasons that I'll mention, that I'll describe below, uh, the ground-based infrared uh, observations can happen, are best done in the near infrared bands, which last somewhere between one to about 2.5 to three microns. And then if you stretch it, maybe you can go to like four microns or something to do ground based observations. But then if you start, if you really want to go to this mid infrared and far infrared regions, so if you want to go to redder and redder wavelengths, that's why you need, uh, you need to actually go to space. And so that's, I think that was one of the main motivations behind launching the James Webb Space Telescope and future missions like the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which are going to be space telescopes, but uh, in the infrared, right? So the question is, uh, yeah, what is infrared good for? So if you if you are a biologist, then infrared is good because you can study. Apparently, you can study the patterns of elephants at night, and this is uh, solely because all all of thermal imaging happens in the happens using infrared detectors, using almost the same infrared detectors that are used for astronomy. But uh, for astronomers, inter uh, infrared observations help you get around the pesky problem of interstellar dust. So space dust, which incidentally, by the way, is also happens to be the name of a very good IPA beer. But space dust is essentially, uh, they are small, about a micron or smaller sized particles of mainly carbon or silicates and a bunch of other metals like aluminum, calcium, magnesium that pervade the interstellar space. And what these particles do is that they, they scatter a lot of the light that is incident upon them. And the, just the way the size of these particles, the chemistry of these particles is such that they scatter blue light more than the red light. So typically, if you have a light from a star or a transient incident upon a lot of uh, upon a dust cloud in the way, uh, most of the optical light actually gets scattered, and the infrared light can actually go through. And a classic example of that is this molecular cloud, where the image on the left is an optical image. And for a long time, people were puzzled by this uh, apparent void in the uh, in our in our galaxy, and uh, because those people didn't see anything in the optical images, and a variety of explanations ranging from you know this is like a, a lack of stars in this region to there's an alien civilization that is blocking all the light from the star in this region to come out come to us. All of these sorts of explanations were suggested, but in reality, uh, the explanations was much simple. It is just that there happens to be a dust cloud in this region, and then the image on the right shows the. Uh, it's it's like a composite inf uh, image that also includes infrared data, and you can see that in the red, you, uh, the, uh, when you look at this region in the infrared, you see a lot of stars, and there is no void at all. So, uh, infrared surveys they basically can see through dust, and so you can really detect many many dust and shrouded objects that will be missed by optical surveys. And then there's a lot of dust in the Milky Way, right? So if you're looking for transients that are that are happening in our own galaxy. Uh, you really can't. You are really limited by uh, this dust extinction in the optical. But you can, if you go to the infrared, you can search for them. But uh, in this school, we are mainly dealing with multi-messenger astronomy, and so over there, we are not that interested. I mean, we are interested in stuff happening in our own galaxy, but we mainly, for AMGW follow-up, we focus on stuff that is happening in other galaxies. And so, why why, why is infrared good for extragalactic transient discovery? And it turns out that uh, infrared astronomy is actually very good for finding kilonovae. So as I'm sure you all know, kilonovae are um, transients that accompany two neutron stars that are merging. So when two neutron stars are orbiting around each other, they come closer and closer because they emit gravitational waves. And eventually, they merge into each other. And there's a, some ejected material that powers a short-lived transient, a fast-evolving short-lived transient called a kilonova. So it turns out that uh, this kilonova uh, the ejecta of this kilonova is rich in very, very heavy elements like lanthanides and actinides. And these elements are basically formed because of this process called, this rare process called R process nucleosynthesis. And I think Shreya covered this in her talk earlier this week. So if you need a review, I would recommend you go to go back to Shreya's slides. But the thing about these lanthanides and actinides is that they have a very large atomic number. And so a large atomic number means a lot of electrons. And so there are a lot of ener electronic energy levels. 
and so the like if you do the some basic uh, some rough combinatorics the, the electronic the number of transitions that an electron can have roughly scales as n squared where n is the number of uh, levels and so uh, basically there are the, the electrons can absorb they, they, they have they have so many transitions that they basically end up absorbing a lot of light that is incident upon them from the kilonova and then basically uh, there's a lot of line this is what is called line blanketing so there's a lot of uh, most of the optical light that is coming from the kilonova itself is absorbed by the ejecta because the electrons are transitioning into other energy levels and it turns out again that optical light is absorbed more than infrared light so kilonovae are expected to be uh, quickly shift most of their emission to infrared wavelengths and uh, the optical emission is expected to be, to be suppressed really really quickly uh, did we actually see this in 170817 uh, which is the only known kilonova yes we did so this plot shows a multi band light curve of uh, gw170817 and as you go from uh, bluer colors like purple over here to redder color to i guess orangish colors on top uh, you are actually going from shorter wavelengths in the ultraviolet to longer wavelengths all the way up to k band which is about 2.2.4 uh, microns and you can see that in the uh, in the optical uh, the kilonova uh, the kilonova emission really dies down very very quickly but it stays on for much much longer in the infrared and it's not very evident from this plot because the in individual bands are kind of shifted but it uh, it was observed that this uh, the a kilonova was also brighter in the infrared bands than in the optical and in fact if you want to look at the look at the kilonova at very very late time so like about 43 days or 45 days since explosion normally for a supernova you would be able to detect it no problem supernova emission lasts for several several tens of days sometimes even several hundreds of days right but the kilonova emission it really fades down within a few days but if you go to a very very long wavelength so this is an image from the spitzer space telescope at taken at 4.5 microns and at 43 days this was the only telescope that could actually detect this kilonova so the this shows that the emission actually really really very quickly shifts to the infrared and it stays long stays in the infrared uh, for a very long time so um, yeah so kilonova they are brighter and longer lived in the infrared than the optical however most kilonova searches are focused on opt optical wavelengths almost all of them and uh, the reason so why why can't we actually just build a ztf in the infrared and try to uh, do all of our emgw searches in the infrared because seemingly they are kilonovi are brighter you have much much longer time to search for them but the problem is that uh, infrared astronomy is uh, difficult it's not very easy so uh, what i'm showing here is on the left side a typical 30 second image from ztf and this is what it looks like you can very nicely see the galaxy you can very nicely see all these stars but on the left side is the same 30 second image but taken with an infrared telescope and you can see that there's really nothing that is visible over here but you can see the entire image is filled with some sort of background some sort of hazy background and the reason for this background is that uh, this is the actually the earth's atmosphere and the earth's atmosphere it emits at infrared wavelengths and now there are ways to correct for this in software so you can actually build a nice sky model background and subtract from the sky to get a similar image like ztf but this affects sensitivity so you need typically much longer for, uh, not much but you need typically longer exposure times to reach the similar depths in the infrared than in the optical um yeah just to elaborate a bit on that this is what the sky spectrum looks like and uh, from in the in the near infrared range so this is for, uh, from 1 micron to 2.5 microns and the uh, there's like this zodiacal component that that's kind of dying down this is scattered solar light solar the sun's light scattered by the interplanetary dust that exists in the solar system and so that's not a lot that's not a huge contributor and it dies it, it's like decaying with wavelength but the main problem in these near infrared bands is actually emission lines of oh in the atmosphere so uh, the atmosphere has a lot of water and oh molecules which are great for life on earth but really bad for astronomy infrared astronomy and so you can see that the sky they have these all of these emission lines narrow emission lines in this region and that actually uh, if you have a wide band filter that covers one to say 1.5 microns you're going to be inundated by this oh absorption uh, as you go this problem only worsens as you go to longer wavelengths because now you're starting to see the thermal emission of the atmosphere pick up so this is uh, the atmosphere is roughly radiates at about you know let's say 300 kelvin and then the 300 kelvin black body the radiation should peak at about 10 microns and so uh, as you start going closer and closer to 10 microns you start getting the thermal radiation so in the infrared you really really if you if you want to go to further redder wavelengths you really need to get over the atmosphere and that's why we have these uh, infrared space missions 
the other uh, the other problem is that ir detectors are much more expensive than normal uh, optical detectors and this is because the ccd detectors that are used for in, uh, optical astronomy cannot be used for infrared astronomy because the wavelength of the light is much longer than uh, the band gap of the semiconductor of like of a typical semiconductor like silicon so in ccd cameras or silicon based ccd detectors won't be able to detect our infrared light so you need special detectors and traditionally an alloy of mercury cadmium and telluric telluride are these detectors so they are called mercat tel detectors in the community they have they have been used but uh, there's only one part so the these detectors have very high costs and um, it's majorly because these detectors are tough hard to manufacture and characterize and partly also because there's only one manufacturer and things always tend to be inflated if there's if any one one company has a monopoly on things uh, but we have slowly started to get around these things by using clever uh, uh, clever observing and data analysis strategies so the first infrared telescope that was uh, i think this was the, one of the this was the first and the largest field of view infrared uh, time domain survey that was built in 2018 at palomar uh, by uh, and a senior graduate student ishal ade who was also part of the ztf school he gave the ztf school lectures when i attended the ztf school as an undergrad um but he he primarily ended up working on this uh, for his thesis so this is a very small tiny telescope which has a only 30 cm aperture so ztf for comparison is a 1.2 meter roughly telescope so uh, this is much much smaller than ztf but it has it's got uh, again a very small field of view uh, compared to ztf so the ztf field of view is 47 square degrees the field of view of palomar gatini ir is 25 square degrees so it's smaller than ztf but i think at, at the time gatini was built the largest field of view infrared telescope was like 0.5 square degrees so this was again a factor of 50 improvement over any infrared telescope and get uh, pgir has been surveying the uh, night sky since 2018 at a cadence of about 2 to 3 days so similar to ztf and it reaches a limiting magnitude of about 16th magnitude this chart over here shows the sky coverage of zt of a pgir uh, and it's the it's color coded by the limiting magnitude that is reached so most parts of the sky it can go to about 17th magnitude or uh, maybe 16th magnitude but then there's this patch of the galactic plane where the limiting magnitude really drops and that's because the galactic plane is so crowded that you start getting limited by confusion noise so you can't really tell one source from the other and so that really affects your uh, sensitivities because sources just get blended into each other and so oops yeah uh so it's 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 been surveying the uh, sky for to limiting magnitude of about 16 to 17th magnitude for the last 3 years and it has been really good at finding several dust and shrouded galactic transients so now the, over here on the left side is a, a galactic is a map, map of the is a dust map of the milky way and you can see all of these all of these black patches and uh, trails over here is actually dust and so if there's any transient in the milky way that's happening uh, say at the center of the galaxy you're most likely not going to see it uh, in the uh, in the optical surveys because it's going through all of this dust which is essentially scattering all of the optical light so we have uh, with pgir we have been finding a lot of dust and shrouded novae uh, uh, so over here for instance uh, you can see the j band this is this is this is the light curve of a nova and it's like significantly brighter in the j band than in the optical bands there are some examples where uh, ztf did not even see a nova because the pg uh, but in the j band it was at like ninth magnitude or 10th magnitude but the ztf to its even though it surveys down to 20.5 magnitude you basically didn't see it just because of all the dust extinction but the problem with pgir is while it is great for galactic science and science in the very very nearby universe because of but its depth is too small to search for Uh, kilo novi at very very large distances so uh, for instance it could potentially detect a kilo nova at a distance of i would say 30 megaparsec or 35 megaparsec or so but uh, most of the ligo alerts come at few hundred megaparsecs or at least 100 megaparsec so if you really need a more sensitive near infrared survey instrument to do uh, to do a meaningful mgw follow up during the future observing runs of ligo and uh, this is where something that i am working on and something that is really passionate really close to my heart comes in uh, so we are building this survey called winter which stands for the wide field infrared transient explorer and the name very naturally lends itself to several game of thrones references so uh, some of some of some of the things that we have come up with is winter is coming obviously uh, one of one that i like is for the night is dark and full of transients and then we are currently soliciting more game of thrones theme taglines so if you have any suggestions feel free to uh, let me know but the idea of winter is that it is much bigger than pgir so pgir was 30 cm uh, winter is a 1 meter telescope almost comparable to this in size to ztf 
the field of view of winter is one square degree. So again, it's about 50 times smaller than ZTF, but still large compared to the existing infrared detectors. And winter is going to operate in the Y, G, and H filters. So Y is the wavelength around one micron, and then J is the conventional near infrared uh, wavelength at about centered at about 1.2 microns, and the H band is centered at about even even redder at about 1.6 microns. And the innovative innovative technology in winter is that it's going to for the first time in astronomy it's going to use these new detector technology called indium gallium arsenide detectors. And these detectors are at about an order of magnitude cheaper than the traditional Mercatel detectors that I spoke about. So if everything goes well with winter, we could potentially have many, many more surveys like this coming up uh, and cost would not be a big issue. Uh, winter, yeah, it's, uh, winter is a Caltech and MIT collaboration and uh, we aim to be on sky in August, 2022. So here is our team. Uh, we installed the telescope of uh, last year uh, and the telescope has been we have been uh, roboticizing the telescope since and it's uh, fully robotic now but the infrared camera is uh, that will actually go on this telescope is being developed at mit and they hope we hope to have the camera ready in about a month and then go and install the camera and start our regular survey operations yeah and uh, one of the main things that we want to do with winter is actually do emgw follow-up during 04 and so uh, to do this, we did, uh, we did, we conducted a simulation of what winter can see during 04 and whether winter has any benefits over traditional optical time domain surveys. And so this plot, it's kind of a, uh, there's a lot going on in this plot. So let's spend some time trying to understand. So on the x-axis over here is the time that it takes to tile the LIGO localization area with your one square degree field of view telescope. So for instance, if the localization area with LIGO is about 100 square degrees, you need like a 1.7, we need 1.7 days to cover the entire localization. And on the y-axis over here is the distance of the LIGO alert, which uh, of the kilo, uh, of the LIGO alert, which comes, uh, which is released by LIGO when they send out the binary neutron star alert. Uh, so what this plot shows is as a function of the time that you have to search for a kilonova versus the distance, what is the probability that your survey will actually detect a kilonova? And so if your localization area is really, really well localized, uh, and the kilonova is really, really, really closed. So then you will detect, you have a very, very large chance of detecting the kilonova. So darker shade of blue means you have a more chance of detecting it. Lighter is less chance of detecting it. But if you have, say, if your localization is very, very large, 500, 600 square degrees, and the kilonova is at very, very large distances, you have very low chances of detecting the kilonova. And so the left side shows the same plot for an R band telescope, and the right side shows the same plot for a J band telescope. And you can see that uh, with a, in the infrared, with the J band telescope, you can detect kilonovae out to much, much, uh, for much, much larger times uh, than in the R band telescope. So you have much longer to search for kilonovae in the infrared. And that is a really, really big advantage because the optical emission dies down very quickly. Infrared emission is long lived. So I think we calculated that in the infrared, you can search for about 1.5 times more longer than you can search for kilonovae in the uh, optical bands. Similarly, uh, the previous plot was for binary neutron star mergers, but the huge topic is what do neutron star black hole mergers look like? It's currently very, very unclear if there should be any electromagnetic emission coming out of a neutron star black hole merger, because uh, if you have like a very, very uh, large mass ratio, so if you have like a 30 solar mass black hole or a 50 solar mass black hole merging with a three solar mass neutron star, you expect the black hole to just gobble up the neutron star without there being any material left outside to power a uh, electromagnetic emission. Uh, but uh, it's very, very unclear because we haven't really seen any, we, we haven't really followed uh, uh, neutron star black hole mergers in great detail. So hugely contested topic is, is there any emission associated with neutron star black hole mergers? And if we believe uh, theoretical models, they suggest that neutron star black holes are even brighter in the infrared than, uh, the, than the optical than binary neutron star mergers. So if you look at the same plot, uh, you can again detect neutron star black hole mergers for much longer in the infrared than the optical, but you can also detect them for much longer, much to much larger distances in the infrared than the optical. So with winter, uh, the dream scenario is there's a neutron star black hole merger, and then we can that is well localized, and we can just cover it with the even with the small field of view of winter, and uh, we can place you can either detect the kilonova or we can place very very strong constraints on uh, the ejecta masses and whether neutron star black holes actually give electromagnetic emission or, or not. And then uh, a big factor in winter operations is actually going to be synergies with ZTF because winter will also go on Palomar Observatory. We have these two observatories that are going to be working in tandem. And uh, winter has a small field of view, so it is very, very good for well-localized that events that are less, less than 1,000 square degrees localization. But O3, uh, like those previous observing runs showed us that you can have very, very large localization. So this is like 
can have a few thousands or more even sometimes even more than 10000 square degree localizations and so if you try to do 10000 square degrees with winter it's going to take you like a month or two months and you're going to lose all the advantage of going into the infrared so uh, but Z with ztf it's really really a piece of cake to tile these very large localizations just because of the large field of view but the problem with these large localizations is that there are many many uh, candidate supernovae or unrelated candidates that pop up and uh, what where winter can help in this is uh, well if we get winter can provide infrared data on all of these candidates that ztf discovers in these very very large localization areas and if it if it's a kilonova you expect it to be bright in the infrared and stay bright in the infrared but if it's a supernova you don't necessarily ex expect them to be um, very very red so you expect supernova emission at early times to be fairly blue and so they don't they're not expected to be bright in the infrared so this having this additional infrared photometry will really help rule out all of these candidates and reduce the candidates from hundreds to maybe a few that we can then go and get spectra of and confirm that this is actually a kilonova so this is just one aspect of how winter and ctf are going to work in tandem uh, during 04 but um, yeah and i guess i think if if other people can if people on this call especially can think of any other uh, uh, cases of uh, you know, any other strategies for synergies between winter and ZTF, we can feel free to discuss them in the uh, Q and A session. Uh, uh, finally, uh, there are some uh, winter and PGIR. Uh, PGIR started the uh, time infrared time, the, roughly the field of infrared time domain astronomy over the entire sky. Winter is going to be the next one, and there are many other upcoming surveys. So, for instance. Uh, there's the DREAMS survey that is going to be uh, DREAMS telescope, which is going to be installed at the Siding Springs Observatory in Australia. So we have got the South Pole, so we have got the Southern Hemisphere covered. It's a, a, sm a smaller telescope than winter, 0.5 meters. It's got a field of view of about four square degrees. And it's going to survey the Southern sky from um, to about 18th magnitude in the J band. Um, it's going to again come online later in 2022. And then there's the other telescope is the Prime telescope, uh, which is going to come up online in, the, in South Africa. Uh, again, in late 2022, it's a larger telescope, about uh, 1.8 meters in size, but we've got the same field, similar field of view to winter. Uh, the main goal is to survey, look at the galactic bulge to uh, search for micro lensing events in the Milky Way. But I think they also have a time domain component uh, where they also have a transients component where they want to look for do MGW follow up or look for other telescopes. So we are re there's really the uh, community is building a fleet of infrared telescopes to actually look at this previously unexplored dynamic infrared sky. Um, yeah, I think that's the end of my slides. I know there's been a lot of data dump, but I think the main takeaway is that there are many, many optical and infrared surveys that are uh, ready. And when LIGO starts its next observing run, uh, we, there are all of these things are going to work together to uh, detect the next kilonova, hopefully coming from uh, hopefully from a binary neutron star merger, but also from a neutron star black hole merger. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. And I'll leave that up. And uh, if there are any questions, happy to.